welcome back to Therapy and Theology and how we can move forward within the the hurts that we're hmm. all experiencing in everyday life. Welcome to uh, my fellow podcaster comrades. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, yeah, so this is Jim Cress. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing counselor, mm -hmm. my personal counselor, and I very much appreciate you. And then, of course, Joel Mutamale, who's on staff with us here at Proverbs 31 Ministries. And um, in some sense, I guess my personal theologian. So, <laughs> I guess so. Oh, yeah. That's, That's so, awesome. I know. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you both for joining me. Today's yeah. topic is something that um, I personally wrestle with, and so I'm mm -hmm. eager to get some free counseling in this. I'm really Absolutely. excited about this session. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna leverage that too. <laughs> session with Jim and Joel, and I don't have to pay for it. This right. is amazing, this right? Is awesome. We'll be your Aaron and her and hold your arms <laughs> and hold up. Your arm, you Moses, you, right? We'll yeah. hold your arms up, yeah. Um, so today's topic is depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And um, of course we could do whole series on both of those words. I specifically wanna focus in on the anxiety because I feel like sometimes the anxiety is the right now situation of emotional feeling and depression is more of an overall um, foundational you know angst within yeah. mm -hmm. my heart and for me i never dealt with either of these um, to any long extent in my life um, to quite the degree that i have to deal with them now and yeah. um, mine has been induced by uh, walking through some pretty traumatic events in my life. And for those of you who have been listening to this series, you know what those events are. For those of you who have not, um, pretty extreme trauma in my marriage, which has now been restored and renewed, but the lingering effects from some of what we walk through um, have proven to be harder than what I anticipated. Mm. Um, and then also facing a near death situation with an emergency surgery that I had to have and, and I wound up in the um, critical care unit for 15 days and mm. pretty, um, pretty severe medical situation. And on top of that, facing breast cancer and all of it being in a pretty condensed time period. Mm -hmm. So some could say, PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder because of, you know, experiencing something and then there's lingering effects that come off of that. But how it often plays out in my life mm. is through feelings of anxiety. And if those feelings of anxiety linger too many days strung together, then this overall feeling of depression can emerge. I'm not saying that that's the way it happens with everyone, but that is right. the way it has happened with me. So regardless of the source of the anxiety, when those feelings are present, it is complicated. It's very complicated mm -hmm. because the reality is your life does not hit the pause button mm -hmm. when feelings of anxiety well, that's true. emerge. That's right. And so, uh, my phone still has a steady stream of text messages coming in. People who are depending on me actually expect me to still work. Um, my family still expects me to show up. Uh, emails still need to be returned. Mm -hmm. Speaking engagements are still on the calendar. Um, or for whatever your job is, you know, there are still demands and expectations that are placed on you and it can be hard to navigate uh, feelings of anxiety in the midst of also trying to do everyday life. Mm. So, um, for me, I am wanting to know, and maybe you are wanting to know, where does anxiety even come from? Why is my body having this response to triggers for me, triggers of past hurts? What is happening when I feel anxiety? Well, that question, we could go in a couple of different directions. One, I'll just touch on lightly and move off of. One of the things is goes back as far as we can get, right? And that's when you're in the womb, any of us. If there is screaming, yelling, other things going on, uh, sometimes even a pregnancy that was not expected and almost like a mother could gasp, like, <gasps> and gasp in, cortisol levels can be released and usually are in the body. So clear back 
in utero, mm. there are things that can go on and often do in a mother's body of tension. When I do work with clients, I often say, let's try to find out what the milieu was you were born in. What do you mean? Well, were you born into trauma, cord around your neck, anything like that? Were you born into feuding and fighting with your parents or mm. a divorce about to be, you know, because the body keeps the score. So it can go that far back that there can be anxiety that's already being kind of bred in um, wired in uh, those neurotransmitters we say that that fire together wire together that's going far back it can be other things that then begin to happen along the way and your sister or brother may have responded differently but you go into what we've talked about on these podcasts of fight flight or freeze so something happens and I'm in a place especially of a fight place or a flight place like just get me out of here and so with anxiety, there can be claustrophobia. There, there, there's a whole spectrum of things. So part of what goes on, that's kind of more of an historical thing. And then I think just the adaptation along the way of, you've alluded to this, a word we've often used is catastrophic thinking. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in trauma or pain, discovery, what happens, or what have you, I can be there and all of a sudden, in that moment, thinking literally the sky is falling. And again, this can become habitual. It can become just such a norm. I think that what happens with anxiety, because I have, have had anxiety in my own life and at times severe anxiety, is that it is, this is my own view of it, that is my body and maybe God's way of saying something's out of alignment in your life. So I had to shift in my healing that anxiety was no longer my enemy. It was a friend saying, tap, 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 Jim, mm -hmm. something's out of alignment. And it feels real. By the way, you probably know this, you talk to a person who's never struggled with depression and you do, the other person go, I just don't get it. Talk to a person who says, I really don't struggle with anxiety, and you do. It's hard for them to understand because all of that, both anxiety and depression, are felt mm. in the body. Mm -hmm. So when someone is feeling anxious, sometimes mm -hmm. it's situational. Like yeah, right. I'm about to get on a roller coaster and I'm afraid of roller coasters. Mm -hmm. Or I'm about to step on a plane and I've seen one too many movies about plane crashes. And um, so that to me seems more situational. Right. Like mm -hmm. uh, uh, fear is introduced, but once you uh, get through that flight, then the anxiety seems to to subside until you have to take another flight. That's right, very situational, right. So, but then there's other types of anxiety where I'll just be going around my normal day and all of a sudden somebody, and it usually comes for me, somebody makes a demand of me like, you know, I'll get a text message, hey, don't forget you have such and such due today. I don't get anxious about the due date or what the task at hand. It's something about somebody coming at me and it's not expected that all of a sudden I find myself getting anxious, not just about what the request is, but about everything. And all of a sudden this small little request, it seems to open up a door called yeah. anxiety in my heart. And all of a sudden I'll just feel like panicked over my whole life and it seems so out of place. Mm. And so, and I hear you say, you know, it's usually tap, 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 like Lisa, something's out of alignment. I'm like, well, what, mm -hmm. what is alignment? I got up this morning, I did my quiet time. <laughs> I'm doing my Bible study. I am exercising, I'm eating right. Like what is out of alignment? Let's think about, okay, let's think about that for a moment in real time. You know, we've talked about this off the set here. We're not faking it. We've sat down, the three of us, really no real script. We're, you're, they're watching, you're watching real conversations. Let's have a real conversation here. Yeah. So we say often, if it's hysterical, that just means I've got energy. If it's hysterical, it's historical. I'll walk with people and say, can you think of one event ever, and you can hypothesize, in your life that would be, you already listed one, if you go there and there could be something on the plane, and what did you say? Because back here I'd watched a movie, so you're already going to some level of a historical context. Mm -hmm. Anything at all in your story, because I can think some in mine, that you can point to to say, somebody says, hey, I need this by the due date, was where, where did that, where's the earliest time you can ever remember that coming up in your life? Not mm -hmm. maybe the earliest, but what's an earlier memory of, uh-oh, I better perform or I better get this done? Can you think of one? Yeah, I mean, I would say probably um, in recent years, it's having to press through getting tasks done, even in the midst of emotional trauma that made me not want to do anything. And everything felt overwhelming. And notice you didn't, your counselor's actually saying this, right? You didn't have to go all the way back to your childhood. So I say mm. when common sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. You go, 
that's enough to go say, well, just deal with that at that level. In recent years, when you maybe felt overwhelmed for very good reason, then something lands. You know, if my cup is full, I'm fine. But if I had one more thing, it spills over. That's where it's, we call it, and you know the term, getting flooded. So okay. you're in a different milieu, in a different real life context, like used to not bother me. Why does it now? Well, you've given the backstory narrative because of what you've been through in the last three years, right? Mm -hmm. Let alone, as you've said very clearly, and I've walked with you through that too, the physical trauma that you literally were on the, the very face of death. Mm -hmm. And see, anxiety, if you study it, always mimics death because the ultimate anxiety is death phobic across all cultures. We're afraid to die, even mm -hmm. though Paul says, grave, where's your sting? Death, where's the victory? There's a sense, so anxiety will feel for a flash moment like I'm dying. Well, you were facing death, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even physically in your body. So if you take just the last three years, it's like any anxiety you would have somehow to me would make sense. So then, okay, so if the cup is full, like right. it's as much as I can take, then how do I reduce the cup so that another drop doesn't tip me over? And it's not that my cup is full of too many tasks. Right. It's probably right. that my cup is full of too much what immediate emotion or uh it's like i've i've exhausted all my emotional reserves usually like, without knowing it uh -huh. and i just use a common term there called bandwidth i don't usually know it but my bandwidth until i know it like i can come home sometime and go i know right now that probably my bandwidth is going to be about that good mm -hmm. if i get into you know if i'm hangry it's not trying to be funny, but if I'm like, I haven't eaten, there's research that shows tons of couples fight, and the only thing they're fighting over is, A, nothing at all. That's in the research. Most, the number one thing couples fight over is nothing at all. But they are, their blood sugar levels are low. They need to eat. So that's an example of bandwidth. But if I'm there and trauma and all this kind of control-alt-delete on the old PC, mm -hmm. it's all playing in the background, I'm not thinking of it 24-7, the trauma, your last three years, whatever, and then something lands... And I go into this, I'm like, I'm overreacting a little bit here. Right. Yeah, I'm probably congruent with what's going on. Somehow I don't have the bandwidth right now to deal with it. Mm -hmm. If you get to what do you do about that, which is what you have done with it, is to explore. That's where counseling, walking with a good friend is. Keep walking and processing my story and being able to say, hey, how you doing today? What's really going on? Name your emotions. You've only got five, which are mad, sad, glad, bad, or afraid. Bad is guilt or shame. Check in and say, how you doing today? Remember the iPhones, others come mm -hmm. up with these emojis? They, they, they're, everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. They can just send an emoji now. So we all do it, is to go, what am I feeling? You know, now that you mentioned it, I've been feeling kind of down. David, right? Psalm 42 and 43. Mm -hmm. Why are you self-talk? Why are you downcast, oh, my soul? Look, mm -hmm. he's looking down into his crud, his emotions. Mm -hmm. And then he looks up and he says, hope thou in God. I will hope in God. So then if you identify, name those emotions one more time. Bad, I just sad. do mad, that's angry, mad, sad, glad, bad, guilt or shame, or afraid. And every emotion you can find comes under these. Tired is not an emotion. It's a state of being. Okay, so people will talk about how you do. These are the emotions that will cover everything. That's been Okay, proven. so those are the emotions. So identify my emotion, and then what? So let's say, okay, I'm mad. So now what do I do? Well, to me, it's a very simple, I don't mean that sarcastically, a thing of saying, if you're mad about something, whether you're doing this as a, a kind of a teaching thing now or real, what, what would be, just give me an idea. Give me 30,000 feet of what you're mad about. Mm -hmm. And I try to get people to stay away from, I don't know, why don't they come into my office, I don't know. I go, well, okay, let's see if we can figure it out. Mm -hmm. So someone says, what are you mad about? Any person I've ever talked with, if they'll take some time, some margin, say, well, let's just look at it. Well, I don't know if I'm, what, and they'll come and say, I think I just, in my life right now, this requires too much, it's a theme of mine, this requires too much of me to fill this in or to get this report done or you know, meet with this person. So what am I upset? I'm often, Jim has been upset about bandwidth. Like I'm honest, we're gonna get to boundaries later in this series mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there, stress is when your gut says no, but your mouth says yes. Oh, that's so good. Ooh. Yeah, that's so that's one of the things I'm going, I've done it to myself, I'm going, I know I didn't have, you've heard me say the line, I'll say, do you have this to give? Say to your spouse, you know, I'd like this, do you have it to give? Oh, I get to respond. You know, actually I don't. Well, and children explain, adults inform. The adult wants to say, hey, um, you know what, Joel, I'm not able to eat, have lunch with you this week. Well, can you give me a reason? No, I really don't know your reason. Thanks for asking, and I don't have that to give. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did I do something wrong? No. <laughs> See, and they can go to that. <laughs> 
mean, Joel has to go, am I mad, sad, glad, yeah. bad? Yeah. <laughs> I, look, hold on. I need to go through I would be things. kind enough to Joel to say, look, my schedule's so swamped, and can we rain check it? Right. It gets a little dicey if you're there and someone says, can I get lunch with you for the fourth time? And you know inside, imagine you in all that God uses you in, and people would want to get to you. And to say, you know, I really don't have that to give yeah. to, to have lunch with you. And yeah. I, thanks for asking. I always kindness. Thanks for asking. And I'm not going to versus, yeah, we'll get to you. Well, my assistant will get to you. And it's like, no, my boundary is I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. we got to just, we've got to get honest. That's really good. Um, in my book, The Best Yes, I wrote about this because I struggle with it. And um, uh, there's a chapter in The Best Yes called The Power of the Small No. And uh, so we'll unpack this a little bit more yeah. during the next episode on boundaries, but the power of the small no is if I know immediately I don't have the bandwidth for this, it's better for me to go ahead and say no, um, let them down because I'm only letting them down this much. That's right. But if I say, you know what, let me get back to you, let me see what I can work out on my schedule, every moment that goes by their That's expectations good. increase. And what are expectations we know? Expectations are premeditated resentments. Mm. So when I know I'm delaying and then and I'm building person up, this is building. They're gonna and that's their issue, but they're gonna have resentments. Mm. Wow. That's I like the small no. I'm gonna use that. That's good to yeah, go. Yeah, the power no. of the small no is like go ahead and it's easier to disappoint them on this level. Right. You True. Know, so their expectations have because if their expectations get up here, then they may a not have time by the time I say no to invite That's someone right. else. So now they're having lunch by themselves and mm. now they're really upset with me. <laughs> or B, they have anticipated and looked forward to the lunch so much that the longer time, then when I say no, it's like a huge crash, right. huge That's, disappointment yeah. where it could have just been a much smaller disappointment. But I want to say something else. I, you know, my daughter, Hope, is my um, one of my personal assistants here at Proverbs 31 Ministries. And so... It's funny because with us being mother-daughter, I probably talk to her in a more comfortable manner than I would someone else who works for me. Right. In other words, she'll say, I'm catching the brunt of your other frustrations. And so oftentimes, like we just had this conversation yesterday, uh, she was going through the list of things to do and I just finally said, I don't know, Hope. I don't I don't know the answer to that question. And I'm frustrated that I even have to try to come up with an answer to that question. And she'll say, Mom, what are you really angry about? Because you're not really frustrated by this request. You you brought frustration into our situation. So what are you really frustrated about? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like this exercise seems so elementary, but I can see how it would be so incredibly helpful. Identify the emotion that you're having, and you just gave us all five of them here, mm -hmm. and then identify what is the real source of that emotion so that the real problem can be attacked and you won't be attacking everyone else in your sphere of influence because anxiety can make you feel that way. Totally. It can make you feel like you're just on edge and whoever comes close is gonna get the sharpness of that right. edge. Right. Here's one of my favorite verses, and Joel, you may wanna comment on this because you know I just love to go to a verse and then like say, Joel. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> yeah. Help me help me not be dangerous <laughs> with this verse, right? But, um, but this verse really has helped me understand the, this practice of introspection and really the practice of lament mm -hmm. and making a turn so that I don't just say, well, I'm feeling this way, therefore I am this way. It is possible for me to feel sad, but not be sad. That's good. It is possible for me to feel mad, but not be mad. It is possible for me to feel angry and not be angry. It is possible for me to feel this um, kind of push of, of resentment, but for me not to walk around as a bitter person, there you go. right? That's exactly right. And I right. think that this, um, this verse really hits at that. In Lamentations chapter three, maybe you haven't been in the Lamentations lately, <laughs> uh, but let's go here, because this really is helpful. Starting in verse 19 of Lamentations three, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. Mm. Now remember on a previous episode, I said, I love deep, therefore I hurt deep. Mm -hmm. And um, I've also discovered about myself because I love deep and I hurt deep, I remember big. So I think wow. some people yeah. have these little flashes mm -hmm. of memories with not a lot of detail. Other people may see a blip of like a black and white movie. 
I see high definition Technicolor. 4K. My, my yeah. memories are as if the event is happening really simultaneously happening. Yeah, with this event. I remember the smallest details. I remember sight, smell, sound, mm -hmm. I, touch. I, I remember the whole situation. It's Think that could have made you a good writer? Maybe. <laughs> Think God may have been up to something there. It's Who a, knows? It's what I call a blursing. <laughs> <laughs> it is a blessing and a curse all wrapped up I in like one. That. But I really relate to this. It says in verse 20, the very next verse, I well remember them. Mm, yeah. And because I remember in such detail and such intensity, you see the intensity of the memory often plays into the intensity of the pain. Mm. And it says, I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. I would love to know a little bit more about that word, my soul is downcast, you know, because it's like, it doesn't just say my mood is downcast, my face is downcast, my uh, feelings are downcast. No, it says my very soul, yeah, my in, soul is downcast. In Hebrew, the, the word soul is like, it's the um, it's the seat of all emotion is, wh is where that's coming from. And so when um, the author of Lamentations is saying my soul is downcast, he's, say he's saying exactly what you just said. It's not just this demarcated one part of my being. He's saying my in the entirety of my being is downcast. It feels low. There's mm. this lowliness to it. So my soul is uh, downcast within me. Then verse 21, yet. Mm. And this Love is that. where the turn comes. I can be sad, but not, I, I can feel sad, but not be sad. I can feel sad yet. I don't have to be sad. Um, one thing I wrote in uh, my book, Unglued, um, that has really helped me. It's become just one of these statements I'll preach to myself over and over and over. My feelings are indicators, but not dictators. Good. In other words, I can, I can feel something and it's very much my reality. Right. Like my feeling is an indicator that something needs to be addressed, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to dictate how I act and react That's true. in my life. Yet this I call to mind, Lamentations 321, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. And that hope seems to be, this is like letting the pressure off or letting the the intensity of the anxiety, um, attaching it not to the hopelessness of depression, but to the hopefulness mm -hmm. of there is something better. Mm -hmm. I can make a turn here. And it says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. So it is an intentional act to call something into my thinking. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore I can have hope because of the Lord's great love. We are not consumed. What a good word, consumed. It's, it's such a good word because when I start to feel anxious, I think I could easily say I am feeling consumed. Mm -hmm. I am feeling like I'm not just wading into a river. I'm feeling like the river is overtaking, consuming right. every part of me and I cannot breathe and I'm panicked. And for me, it's not really the fight, flight or uh, freeze. freeze. For me, it's freak out. Yeah. It's really the song. Isn't there a song? Ah, freak out. Yeah. No, 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 right? Dating yourself a little yeah. bit there, but yeah, I like that. That is seriously right. what happens to me. I will completely freak and out. And it is seriously what's happening in your brain and body. It's not a an anomaly or it's like your body is into a freak out mode. Like what the, just trying to get an idea of what's really happening here. It's and, crazy making. Yeah, and what it feels like to me is all the nerves that are supposed to be inside my body come up to the edge of my skin mm. and they're yeah. raw and just the very air around me is agitating me to the point where I feel consumed. Mm. But this verse seems to say there is a possible thing to call to mind and it's because of the Lord's great love, we don't have to be consumed for his compassions never fail. So in other words, it, it seems to be saying he's not judging me. He's not um, coming against me. He's not shaming me. Um, he's reminding me. Yeah. He's reminding me that his compassions are a perfect match for the anxiety that I feel. Yeah. And I wanna just point to real quick joining you, isn't it interesting, and I'm thankful for it, that modern psychology and counseling 
went there without knowing it because mm -hmm. God is the God of all wisdom mm -hmm. and we call that mindfulness mm -hmm. and predating Freud and all the yep. uh, predating all of modern psychology God the greatest sukeologist the study of the of the soul God's got it right there that's pure what we call mindfulness of just everything's flying I gotta breathe get grounded, not look just down. I need a more glimpse at my problem and gaze at Jesus instead of glimpsing at Jesus and gazing on my problem. We reverse that. That's what is taught in mindfulness and whole courses are coming off that verse. They wouldn't admit it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's because mindfulness off that. sounds a little new age oh, sure. or a little. Mm -hmm. um, it's very like old outside. age, isn't it? Yeah. But I love what you just said. It's old yeah. age, and it yeah. goes on to say, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, so I'm mm. calling something to mind and then I'm preaching it to myself. Right. Yeah. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. You see, mm -hmm. I feel anxiety mm -hmm. because I, I feel something's out of control. That's right. But if I can remember that the Lord is my portion, I can feel out of control, but not act out of control. If I remember he is in control, mm -hmm. like he is my portion. Therefore I will yes. wait for him and wait means pause. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of the best things I can do when I feel anxious is to hit the pause button, yeah. stop reacting to everything around me, take some deep breaths, do this, call to mind, preach to myself out of my mouth, and it really does help. It's amazing. It's so good. That's so good. So um, I think today's episode is going to be really helpful for people. I really like what we've talked about. I like identifying one of those five emotions. Mm -hmm. I've never taken it that simple. I've always mm -hmm. thought there's a million emotions out there. <laughs> it's very complicated when you feel everything in technicolor, but really bring it back to the basics. There are five. Let's say them one more time. Mad, sad, glad, bad, guilt or shame, or afraid. Okay, and so we feel an emotion, we can identify the emotion, mm -hmm. and just like I said, we can have that feeling. A feeling is an indicator that something needs to be addressed, but it doesn't have to be a dictator how we act and react. Mm -hmm. It's not only true from a therapeutic standpoint, but from a theological standpoint as well. Yeah. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, yeah. Jim. Thank you for tuning in.